John Penrose, great to have you with me here on Money Talks. As a former minister and a Tory MP, what did you think of the autumn statement? I thought it was a good start. Um, I thought that it was really necessary to calm down the markets, which have been in complete sort of, you know, um, you know having a bit of a dose of the smelling salts mm -hmm. over the previous couple of weeks. Uh, but it's only a start. So it's a very difficult situation. I think Jeremy Hunt did a really good job in sort of navigating through that difficult situation. But now, now we've got to do a whole lot more to get the economy engines revving faster, unblock the arteries of, you know, of Great Britain PLC, if I can put it that way. So... It's bought us time, it's created stability, all of those are absolutely essential. But I think Jeremy Hunt was quite right to say um, that's only the beginning. And he started talking about some of the reforms that we're going to need, but I think we've got to go a lot further and a lot faster, and I, and I hope he will. Raising taxes to a new post-war high when we're already going into recession, when interest rates are going up, when there's a cost of living squeeze, when households, firms are struggling. Did was that really the right thing to do? I, I, I didn't like it, um, but I don't think he had very much choice. Um, and it was sort of a painful necessity. And I, and I speak as somebody who, you know, I'm a, I'm a sound money Tory. So I, you know, I believe you've got to, you can't spend money you haven't got, or you can't run up the nation's credit card because otherwise, um, other, otherwise pretty soon the IMF and other people come knocking. Um, so he avoided all of that. But I'm also a low tax Tory. And so you know, once you've got the sound money, once you've got those solid foundations, you've got to set the economy up so you can cut taxes. But you can't cut taxes using money that you've borrowed. It doesn't work. Um, much though I want us to, and much though I, w I hope we're going to get to the point where we can start doing that again soon. I mean, lots of us in the political media class, we've been following those guilt yields, haven't yeah. we? The cost that the government must pay in interest to investors to borrow money. John Penrose, since that autumn statement that was meant to you know, be welcomed by financial markets, the guilt yield's gone up. The markets thinks we've gone too far with these tax rises. Growth will be even slower, the recession deeper, which will make the fiscal situation worse. Well, so uh, if you look at what happened to the, to the long-term guilt yields, as you were rightly pointing out, what happened was they went up sharply um, after the mini budget. They didn't like that. They were un unhappy about the, uh, about the uncertainty. When Jeremy started pouring um, oil on troubled waters, if I can put it that way, they came back down again. They yeah. came back pretty much down to where they'd been before the before the mini budget. So that was, I think, yeah, really good news. And that was before the autumn that statement, before the when autumn he statement. dismantled a lot of the trust yeah. quoting yeah. mini exactly. budget. So, so, but what was also, yeah, you know, they've since gone up after they, the they, autumn they, statement. They, they have, but the markets don't like it. Well, I'm not sure it's that the, the markets don't like it. I mean, it's always hard to work out precisely what the market is thinking. But, but I, I think what you've also got to remember is that. Globally, mm. interest rates are rising. And that all started when America and the Fed started raising interest rates mm, six, nine months ago now. Um, and so there's a gentle but steady, inexorable upward trend going on. We aren't immune from that. So uh, what all we can ask for, I think, is that we manage to get ourselves as low as possible against that rising international trend. I think that's what Jeremy's done. And what it means is that the uh, you know, if you look at the uh, what the projections are saying, we're likely to be in recession because of the pandemic, because of the war in Ukraine. Um, but at least it's made the, the likely coming recession less bad, less less deep um, and less long lasting than it would otherwise have been. But it's almost certainly still going to be a recession, which is you know, really bad news. But you can't you can't pretend it isn't about to happen. Labour have adopted the language of the doom loop, this idea that much higher taxation will drive us deeper into recession than we otherwise would. They're not entirely wrong, are they? I mean, I hope that, I hope you'll pause while I while I smile ruefully at the notion of the Labour Party talking about about higher taxes and that sort of stuff because they they're the ones with form here, if I can put it politely. Um, they are they are of course right, and as a low tax Tory, as I said before, you know, I I just genuinely believe that when you can, you should cut taxes because households and businesses know better about how to spend their money than governments do, and it's just fundamentally a you know a basic. Um, principle of you know, why I'm why I'm a conservative in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so great to hear that the Labour Party has suddenly got religion and has come round after generations of believing and behaving precisely in the opposite way. But I think you've got to be clear. You can't spend money that you haven't got. You've but if got even to... Labour are saying your tax rises are too much. Yeah, well, I, I don't think they're saying they're too much. I think they're pointing out the dangers. But I don't think um, I'd be interested to know whether or not um, they reckon that they would start borrowing an awful lot more in order to pay for taxes, tax cuts or, or, um, or other spending, which we don't have the money for, which we you know, which are not based on sound money. I think if they did that, the markets would, would have another um, attack of the cody wobbles as well. The autumn statement really put a full stop, didn't it, and some 
after the Trust Kwateng mini budget. Uh, those two individuals, as former Chancellor and former Prime Minister, seem for now to have been cast out into the political um, wilderness. But not everything they were trying to do was wrong, was it? What should we take from what Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwateng were trying to do? Surely the thrust of their policies, yeah. you'd agree with John no, Penrose. No, no, absolutely right. I mean, they, they were right to say that the economy hasn't been growing fast enough and that our long-term underlying rate of growth isn't nearly good enough. And, and particularly because, you know, like most other developed nations, we've got an aging population, so we're going to have to grow faster to pay for um, all, all their benefits and pensions and all those other important things. So, so, yeah, they're absolutely right. We have got to grow faster as an economy. What we've been doing for the last you know, more than a decade, 14, 15 years, isn't enough. Um, the, the, the thing which is required and the thing which we've actually really got to put our foot on the accelerator on are these underlying economic reforms, these microeconomic reforms, what Thatcher used to call supply side reforms. And I know they're... It's they're become a, a dirty phrase, isn't I know. it? You're Why not allowed to talk about supply side well, reforms. I'm, I'm here to reclaim it on behalf of the, of, of, the, of the Conservative Party. I think it's really important and it's the only way to unblock the arteries of Great Britain PLC. And it's the only way to make the economic engine just rev a lot faster. What would you say, how would you explain supply side reforms to the average voter, yeah. to GB News viewers and listeners. Yeah. As we say in journalism, to my mum. And, and to my mum too, almost certainly. Uh, so, so supply side reform is, is just this slightly Westminster village -y kind of phrase, but really what it just means is freeing up the economy to, to move faster, to be more nimble, to modernise quicker, not to get held back by red tape and you know Sir Humphrey in, in Whitehall or whatever it might be, and just get on with the job and to be faster and better and more competitive internationally. And there's a whole range of uh, you know, uh, legal and regulatory reforms that we just need to modernise and update. I mean, did you know, Liam, that our, our, all our competition rules, for example, they were written back before Google was invented? Before yeah, the last Facebook Competition was, Act was 1998, yeah, it's, right? it's, it's when Peter Mandelson was, yeah. was in charge. Just shows you how much... Analog of, rules for a digital uh, age. You have it, exactly. So we, we've, <laughs> we've got to... Uh, that's, an, that's a really good example about the sort of stuff that we've got to update because we're just, we're, we're just sort of, you know, bimbling along with, with something that's out of date. But supply-side reforms, they're tough. Yeah. You have to take on vested interests. You mentioned, you know, introducing rules that impact Google and Facebook. Good luck with that, mate. These guys absolutely yeah. dominate political lobbying. Yeah. Many, many politicians and their advisors end up working for the tech giants mm -hmm. as they come out of office on huge salaries, as you know, and quite a few journalists as well. Yeah. Tackling the planning reforms, getting more homes built. If it was easy, it had been, been done a long time ago. Yeah. It strikes me, John Penrose, if I may say so, that putting taxes up on the just about managing classes, the squeezed middle is pretty easy compared to taking on the vested interests, the interest groups, frankly, that donate a lot of money to political parties, not least your party. All parties, yeah. It's really tough to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I see anyone in this government that's got the grit to do this. Well, uh, yeah, I'm, I, if they give me a chance, there are others like me who would like, who would love the chance to do it. But, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, he, here's the point. Um, the current Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, when he was Chancellor, commissioned me to you know, write a whole series he of did. ideas, a whole series of ideas about how to get this done. And, and so he, he, I think, gets it. He understands it's important. And now he's, now he's Prime Minister. If anyone's well placed, he is. But you are absolutely right, Liam, to say that it, it isn't easy. If it was, it would be you know, done much more regularly. Um, and it isn't just really big tech giants like Google and Facebook, who you mentioned. It's also the Sir Humphreys of the, uh, in, in, in Whitehall, it's the entire sort of you know, regulatory establishment um, who are used to the way things are. And you've got to say to them, no, actually, things could be better, could be different. So there's an awful lot of vested interest. But there's one really big thing that we have going for us, which is this stuff is cheap. It's difficult to do politically, but in terms of taxpayers' money, it costs four-fifths of nothing at all. Mm. And that makes it probably the only game in town, certainly mm. the best option, mm. at a time when money's tight. You're a very experienced politician. You've got a lot of experience in business. You did indeed write the Penrose Report, uh, which I wrote about at the time, at the beginning of, of, of last year. And it's interesting now that you're doing an update to that, yeah. which I'm sure the then-Chancellor who commissioned you, now Prime Minister, will take note of. But we both know that big business often likes this regulation because they've got the, the money, the wherewithal, the huge compliance departments in order to get their arms around it and comply with it. It's the small and medium-sized enterprises. This stuff strangles them. Surely 
That's what the Conservatives are for, helping small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs that you've just clobbered with a massive increase in corporation tax. Yep, absolutely. That, that, those are the people who are most hit by this sort of stuff and who have most to benefit. It's the entrepreneurs and the fast growing companies. And you're absolutely right to say big businesses got big by making the current system work to their advantage. Yeah. And they've got a vested interest in not changing it. Um, so we need to make sure that we are firmly on the side of the disruptors, of the newcomers, um, of the people with a bright idea and who aren't there yet. Um, and if we get right behind them and make it easier for them, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. I see a lot of people in the cabinet with big business experience. They work for flashy investment banks and so on. I don't see anyone in the cabinet, with all respect, with that crucial small business okay. experience. And I think that shows, if I may say so, in some of the policy making. Funnily enough, um, one of the things that makes most people in, in, uh, in Westminster roll their eyes is when Jeremy Hunt starts talking about the fact that he used to be an entrepreneur, because mm. he was, and he mentions it quite a lot. So, so I think actually there are some entrepreneurs in that cabinet. Um, and, but you need a blend. You, you need people who, who've both been there, done that with the small startup you know, in a basement somewhere or in a garage, and you need the big business folk. And you need to have both of them and because actually we want the whole economy to do well. But yeah, you need to make sure that the folks who've got the entrepreneurial experience yeah, have, that, have a really loud voice. Where would you really focus your efforts on supply side reform, John? I know you've thought a lot about this. Mm -hmm. Let's get specific because as soon as we start getting specific, we're going to start annoying people, aren't we? Yeah. But that's the point. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm resigned to the fact that I'm going to be crossed off people's Christmas card lists as a result of this, but it's what's necessary. So, What are in your crosshairs then when you talk to the Prime Minister, with whom you do have a very close relationship on this stuff, as a lot of people at Westminster know. Yeah, well, so the, there are a couple of things. For example, everybody in Westminster always talks about bonfires of red tape and getting rid of, uh, getting rid of you know, um, red tape and regulations. Um, it's easy to talk about. It's really hard to do. We had a system that worked really well up until Theresa May took over. So all the way through the Cameron years, we had a system which actually was systematically going around and getting rid of red tape, um, but it couldn't do anything about all the stuff that started in Brussels because we were still in the EU at the time. Now we're out, that system's been abandoned um, under Theresa May, we need to reinstate it, get back to it, and basically there's an enormous great big sort of untapped reservoir of stuff we can go at. Now we're out of the EU, which we can have a go at and say, we can still maintain all those standards, we can still make sure that our drinking water is just as safe as ever, that the food we eat is, is fine, that the environmental standards are all fine, but we can deliver those standards much more cheaply, much more digitally, much more nimbly, um, and so we're going to have a great life, but it won't cost us as much in the process. What happened to that one in, two out policy? The idea of for every new regulation, you had to junk two others. Yeah, so that, that's what we were doing. It was working. Um, and that's what got abandoned in about 2017. Um, and guess what? Since then, in the last four or five years, we've been going backwards. Yeah. Um, so what we replaced it with has turned out to be pretty toothless. So what I'm arguing is we want to go back to that and now apply it to all those rules which it couldn't apply to before. Now we're out of the EU. All those rules that started in Brussels, we can now have a go at using one in, two out. Even one in, one out, I wouldn't mind. Yeah. Just let's get going. You voted Remain, but I remember during those Brexit wars, you were absolutely adamant we need to go ahead with Brexit. And you ended up working quite closely with the, the European Research Group of, of, of so-called hardline Brexiteers, John. Are we making the most of Brexit? Surely there's more we can be doing. What happened to those free ports, those investment zones, all that seems to have been junked in this autumn statement again. So, so uh, I, I'm really a firm believer that, yeah, I mean, I understand that all these things had to take a bit of a backseat during the pandemic when everyone was sort of running around with their hair on fire trying to deal with that. But now the pandemic's largely gone. Um, we've got to get back to realising the benefits, the potential of Brexit. Um, and I don't think we've done nearly enough. It's understandable with, with other things like the pandemic going on and now a war in Ukraine, but actually, Now's the time. We can't let this wait any longer. There's huge opportunities the and, we, and we haven't taken it. It was a step backwards though, wasn't it? What happened to those investment zones? What would you say, John, if I told you, truthfully, a cabinet minister recently described to me um, the current chancellor uh, as a cipher for treasury mandarins who want a quiet life? Direct I, quote. I, I think that's probably pretty unfair. Um, but what I would say is, um, you're right that you know, while not all the all those those underlying reforms which you mentioned from the, the mini budget have survived, um, 
Jeremy Hunt introduced a bunch of new ones. So he's talking about getting on with digital competition regulation, renewing all of that stuff, the, the, the changes to our competition rules that you and I were just talking about. Um, but I'm hoping, I'm expecting, I'm going to be pushing for him to go further and faster than that in future too. And that, that, that's going to be the challenge. It's taking on those vested interests that you were talking about. Before. People in so-called left behind parts of the country, they, you know, they want investment. They want hands on jobs, well-paid manufacturing jobs. Free ports and investment zones were designed precisely to attract the inward investment that would create those jobs. With all respect, you know, you're a very bright guy and talking about you know, digital reforms and competition law and so on, I'm completely with you. That stuff is massively important. But for regular red wall voters, free ports and investment zones are important. Council housing is important. Um, planning reforms yeah, absolutely right. are important. Yeah. And in all these areas, we seem to me to not be making progress. So, so I mean, housing is a really good example about where we've got to do more. It's one of the one of the things I've got on my list to take to the Chancellor. Yeah. We've actually got the levelling up bill that's coming to Parliament this week. Um, and so I and a lot of your colleagues are trying to amend it. So um, I, I'm, I've put down an amendment to, to myself. Yeah, yeah um, to, to entrench so-called nimbyism. Well, no, I'm, I, the, the amendments I'm putting down um, are ones to make it much, much cheaper and faster to build beautiful, good-looking new homes um, in our existing towns and cities. Um, so that you know, most, on average, our, our towns and cities are about two stories tall. Mm. There are some really good looking parts of cities that are four stories tall. Now, if you can allow people to go up to that and it and it matches the best of what's there already, you could almost double the amount of housing that's available on the and, same footprint on the mm -hmm. same footprint. And it'll look really good and it'll use an awful lot of the same infrastructure. So it's cheaper o o overall. Why are we doing that? So I'm putting down amendments to do that as an example of the kind of thing which I think we should be doing. Uh, any plans to get back in government, John Penrose? Oh, it, it'll depend on whether or not those on a higher pay grade want to ask me. But uh, if, if, if they want someone to do this kind of stuff, of course, I'd be happy to. And the important thing here is that there's a, there's a big opportunity which, you know, which is available and we need to move faster to take it. John Penrose, thanks a lot for joining me on Money Talks.